Oh, we're on. I have another ready or taken. My light went off. Um, so we'll be resuming our meeting now. Um, we've returned from executive session. It just ended uh, to discuss the contract board negotiate board negotiations between the Scarborough custodians and the food service employees and the board. And now I will ask if there are any adjustments to the agenda this evening. Um, I do not have any, but I think that you might. I, I do. Actually, I would like to add a 6.4, and that would be to, to request um, some monies from the board's contingency fund to purchase a Wentworth brick. So we'll be taking that up after we do our appointments this evening and before our workshop piece. Other than that? Point four. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now moving on, we have 6.1. We have the meeting minutes from December 5th, 2013. Move approval. Second. Okay, any corrections that need to be made that anyone noticed? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the minutes as presented? Seven plus two. Okay, so moved. Then we have a 6.2. We have a donation from the Kraut's Neck Association. I will turn that over to Dr. Entwistle. Uh, it, is, it is in your packet. It was um, a donation request um, made by Mr. Legage to help um, assist the Scarborough girls hockey team with the purchase of uniforms and some ice time. And the Prouts Neck Association allocated one thousand uh, dollars for that purpose. And the will of the board. Move Second approval. Move, move acceptance. With thanks. Okay. Uh, all, I had a first. I had a second. All in favor of accepting the donation made by the Prouts Neck Association Community Grant Program. Seven plus two, and with our thanks very much for their continued support of the Scarborough School Department. So thank and, you. And yeah. Mrs. Jackson used to chair this committee. Oh, all right. I was not aware, but thank you for letting me know. If, if Mr. Legage is accepting this, who's sending the thank you letter? The high school, I'm assuming, Mr. Creech. Does the high school send I know it? the girls' hockey team. The, oh, the girls' hockey team uh, intends on sending one, and I believe either the principal or athletic director yes. will send one okay. as well. So, um, all right, then we have uh, 6.3. We have our appointments this evening, and I think I will turn that back over to Dr. Anderson. Again, they are as presented, 6.3.1. Um, and okay. Okay. approval. Second. Any comments, questions? Just a note here. I see that two of them. Yes. Oh, Say first. Two of them are actually booster funded, and that would be the boys' basketball and the girls' basketball um, assistant coach positions are booster funded. So, is there anything else? I uh, just wanted to make sure that that wraps up this this um, season for okay. for stipends. I believe. Yeah. Correct. I think I think when you see uh, when you see the chart get that small, <laughs> I think we're, we're done. Pretty much done. <laughs> Good. Okay. So all in favor of approving the appointments as presented, seven to the ladies? Sure. Yes. Seven plus two. All right. So moved. Thank you. And then we have our uh, 6.4, the added item. And I would be asking, um, the question is, is that we would like to <coughs> purchase, if we would like to purchase a brick for the new Wentworth walkway on behalf of the Scarborough Board of Education and the funds would be taken from the Scarborough Board of Education's contingency fund that we have for so things moved. that we do. All right. Of, oh, in the amount, I'm sorry, in the amount of $150 for a heritage brick, which is eight by eight, and I believe that the brick is going to say Scarborough Board of Education 2014. If members then would also like to purchase an additional brick on their own with their name on it, it could go around um, the brick that says Scarborough Board of Education in the center. So uh, I heard a so moved for our first, and you have a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments on that, Jackie? I just think it's appropriate that we, in fact, do this. I personally will be purchasing a brick as a member of the board, and I am hoping that former members of this uh, Board of Education will, in fact, uh, purchase bricks and want to be have them seated in that that same area that can be a request uh, 
this now puts bricks up to three for me because the building committee is going to have one, have an area, and the Kiwanis Club is going to have an area. And uh, I want to encourage families. Uh, perhaps you'd like to have one for your whole family, perhaps for your grandparents, perhaps for your children. Uh, it's a great way to recognize members of your family and close friends. The deadline, just so you know. Oh, yeah, I was just going to, well, it's been extended to April 1st to ensure installation by opening day. Um, but I just wanted to also make sure people are aware that um, it's not just for Wentworth students. There is some idea around town that, oh, my kids already went through Wentworth. I don't need a brick. But this is really a community <laughs> space, and it's a big plaza. It's not just a walkway or a driveway into the school. So I imagine there will be public functions that happen on the Wentworth Plaza. So it really is a community thing. So if you want to thank teachers or in memory of your grandmother who passed away but was a Scarborough graduate or whatever, even if they weren't, um, there's a lot of opportunities. We've also heard of people that um, are putting secret messages to their kids on the bricks for them to go find on the first day of school. And I think it's kind of cute. You know, sure. just a lot of, oppor lot of different <laughs> opportunities. Chris. Maybe the championship hockey team would like to have a brick. Yep. There are small ones for fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for the benefit of the public, we could. Do we know the process or who they need to contact to get bricks? Oh yeah. yes, you can yeah. go right to the uh, Scarborough School website, and I believe it's on the home page. It is, but it's bricksareus.com backslash Wentworth. It's, that's the address, and it's completely um, tax deductible. One hundred percent. As well as, just so you know, they'll uh, notice we'll be going home in uh, folders if you have kids uh, K two, oh, K five, and then power school for kids six twelve. So there should be notices all over. So all in favor then of approving the expenditure of the hundred and fifty dollars out of the board's contingency fund seven plus two. Thank you very much. So moved. So just one more question: Do you want us to go online and? Make sure our names go under the school board. If you want to purchase, you want to. If you want to, if you want to purchase another brick, in addition to the one that we're going to have that's the Scarborough Board of Education, right? Um, then you can just go online, and you can. There's, I think, a memo section. There's three lines for the four by eight bricks, and then six lines for the heritage, which is the um, $150 eight by eight brick. Right. So, the school board now, we just voted on it, will have the $150 double-sized brick, and it will just say Scarborough Board of Education. 2014. 2014. And then I imagine this is what I would expect, that we would put our names, Board of Education, 2014. So you would use the three lines. On, on, a, a on the brick. $50 oh, oh. brick. Do you, do you wanna, if you want it, I mean, it's if you, you want, want, you want. Yes. Do you yeah. want to have a template or something? For, can you give us an, I mean, just so we're all con, con, continue, I mean, how... Sure. As Kelly said, you know, our names, the school board member, and then the date. I happen to know the person who reviews the brick orders. Okay. She might be that, sitting across the table, table from you. I'm sure they all match, if okay. that is the case. All right. Yeah, okay. No. okay. All right. So then we'll look to that, and payment can be made directly online, or you can write a you check, write and then goes it goes up to Kate Bolton in the finance department. So. Okay. All right. Moving on, then. Sorry about all of that. Uh, we are moving on to our workshop session, then. We have 7.1 in IT, uh, information technology cost benefit analysis, and I guess mm -hmm. we'll turn it over to you. Um, yes, I think the topic is a little uh, deceiving. It's IT cost benefit analysis. Really, it's um, an answer to the question, where is technology going in the Scarborough School District? And we have Jen Nichman um, here tonight, um, uh, David Creech and, and Monique Culbertson as well. Um, just as an introduction to Jen, you know, she, those of us who work closely with her know that um, Jen has accomplished much and she has created um, a very, very impressive track record of exceptional leadership of the technology team and she has done that in a very, very short period of time. Uh, Jen is unquestionably the content expert when it comes to technology. None of us um, question that. We bow down to her. She is the go-to person. Uh, am I right? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, and it's for all of us. She has been able to organize and prioritize and plan and to execute those plans in a way that has quickly uh, made Jen an invaluable resource uh, to the whole school organization and to the town, though we try to keep her um, on the school side just as much as we can. Um, this is an opportunity for Jen to give you a real flavor uh, for the work that has been accomplished, and I think you'll be very impressed. Um, the work that is also in the queue, the stuff that's ongoing, and as well um, what she has lined up and what she's thinking about both in terms of the short and long term future priorities for technology in Scarborough. So I'll turn it over to John. Okay, well, I hope I can live up to all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't trying to edge my way out the door. I was going to shut the late. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just concerned that your voice is not going to be picked up. There might be a portable microphone, is there, or not? There, if there's not, then if you could, there, there you go, Jen. I think if you just kind of occupy that space there, you, you'll be picked up. Okay, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so I, before we kind of see where we are now, I thought it would be helpful for us for us to start at where we were a couple of years ago, sort of where we've come from. There we go. So this is, I thought this would be a good agenda for us to run through the historical perspective where we've been. Then we'll take a look at um, 21st century skills, which we hear a lot about, but I'm going to tell you where they came from and how they apply to technology. Um, and then the current environment, so kind of where we are today, and then talk about where we're going. And then we can stop me at any time with questions. So if we sort of step in the way back machine, well, it's not way, way back, I guess. It's like four years back. Um, the year is 2010, 2011. At this point, we have very limited devices that are shared throughout the district. There's workstations. There's laptops. Is that what you're saying? Oh, okay. Workstations, laptops. There's some projectors, um, but there really aren't any tablets. It's not one-to-one, -one, um, and we don't have a lot of sort of the more advanced technology. The cloud apps are used on a limited pilot basis. When I say cloud apps, I mean things like Google, um, the way that you guys are using PowerSchool now. Um, very small groups are kind of sticking their toe into the waters. There's really no school-owned advanced technology. By advanced, I mean things like 3D printers, um, the Eno boards, the interactive boards, wireless projectors. Uh, there are no technical integrators. So I don't know how many of you know Courtney Graffius, but she's a fantastic resource for the K2s. She also has started working with the middle school. And basically what Courtney does is she takes technology and she works with the staff and she figures out ways to take technology and integrate it into the curriculum. We had very limited bandwidth. We had about 50 meg, which we had at, up until about a month ago. Um, but what that means really is there's only, if you think of bandwidth as sort of your highway, there's really only so much space on the highway for so many cars, and you're going to get backed up. Uh, we have really outdated communication channels. I, mean, I think we sort of all know that from the website. Internally, we had an intranet. The intranet was very outdated, very limited um, functionality. And we did not have any wireless connectivity with the projectors. The only reason why I bring that up, that sort of seems like a, a minor thing, but really I bring that up because wireless connectivity with the projectors allows for freedom within the classroom. So if you think about it, if you're a teacher, you have a tablet and you're connecting wirelessly, now all of a sudden you're not stuck behind a computer at a desk, you're not st static, you're not stagnant, you can get up and you can move around the classroom, you can interact with your students. So I thought we should talk a little bit about the Partnership for Skills in the 21st Century, because this is really sort of the concept of where our objectives fell out. It, so what is this, really? Because people kind of talk about it a lot. There, there's a website that you can go to, you can, um, read up about it, there's a ton of material. 
Um, but really, it's a coalition of businesses, educators, policymakers. When I say businesses, I mean Microsoft, Dell, um, you know, the, the big companies, big tech companies. So they get together with educators, policymakers, and they really develop sort of a set of parameters that they felt schools and communities needed to be able to move, move ch children, K-12 kids, forward um, to really create a global citizenship. The skills, so they have a whole skill set, tons of stuff. Again, go out to their website if, you have, if you're really interested in it. But I'm just going to boil this down to sort of what was important for technology. Skills included information communication, technology literacy. So really that means um, information, how you get it, where you get it, how you use it. Communication, and that included social media. And then technology literacy, how literate are you on the computer, on the tablets, different um, applications, software. <coughs> then they have the three C's, creativity, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, and communication collaboration. And those are really sort of the learning outcomes. And what we're trying to develop is a support system for that. So that helped us to, de to develop our overarching goal. And this is the overarching goal that we put into the um, state technology plan. And that is a three-year plan. We have to do it every three years. And we sort of have one major goal and then things fall out of that. So the major goal is really provide technology at and for the point of learning. So what does that mean? To us, we, we sat down together as a group for, I don't know, Monique, months? <laughs> yeah, like it. And went through what this really means. So we, we identified these sort of key bullet points. Increased student and staff access to integrated technology. So having students and staff be able to get <coughs> the technology that they need to accomplish those goals. Increased mobility. And when we say increased mobility, I don't just mean increased mobility, you know, as you sort of think about it today in your personal life, meaning I've got a cell phone and I now can go everywhere. This is also increased mobility in the classroom, like what we talked about with the wireless connectivity. It's increased mobility around the campus, so having everybody sort of on the same system, on the same network, accessing the same resources. Deployed devices to better support STEM and STEAM. So STEM and STEAM, um, you know, is something that people talk about a lot, but really it's science, technology, engineering, math, and then arts. And when we talk about these types of curriculum, we're talking about advanced Lego robotics. Um, we're talking about being able to code at school, learning to code at school. We're talking about 3D printers for engineering, for architecture, things like that. Enable online distance learning opportunities. So again, we talked about this at length. Really, that when you think about online distance learning, I think a lot of us think about at Kaplan University or something, you know, where you're going to get online, you're going to take a college course. But we also feel like this applies internally to the campus because if you have a middle school student who's interested and has reached that level where they want to take an advanced course, maybe they want to take technology in the 21st century from the high school so that they can be that much further ahead when they get to the high school, this would allow them that opportunity. Improved communications. and. When I say improved communications, I don't just mean um, staff to students. I don't just mean, you know, internally uh, central office staff. I mean communications campus-wide, district-wide, and communications with the public. And then, of course, we want to create cost efficiencies. So we're always looking for ways to implement new things that will save us money in the end. So those goals kind of brought us to our current environment. When we say current environment, you know, I'm talking about 2010 to 2011 to now. So the past couple of years, some of the things that we've implemented. As you know, we did an MLTI refresh. So we, instead of the um, Macs, we now have HP. We have a Windows environment. And what that allowed us to do, though, um, was go one-to-one -one at the middle school completely. So now the sixth grade is also one-to-one. -one. So it's created this um, sort of microcosm of a one-to-one -one environment that's been really, from my perspective, been really exciting to watch grow and develop. 
um, to have the sixth graders have laptops has been a great thing. We've heard from lots of the staff down there that they've really been able to expand their curriculum, their learning opportunities, and the communication with the, with the students. Um, increased wireless capabilities, so as we've put in new projectors, for example, we have made them all wireless capable. So now, um, for example, at the middle school, and we've rolled out half of the high school, um, you, the teachers can communicate wirelessly with the projectors, with their tablets, and also with their laptops. Um, we also have wireless printers, so it's a completely mobile environment down at the middle school. We've got kids who are out in the portables, and we've got kids who are in the main building, and those kids can go anywhere and print anywhere and communicate. We have increased bandwidth. We went from 50 megs to 200 megs recently. And the reason we did that was because we were maxing out at the middle school, but in anticipation of bringing Wentworth online. And then in anticipation, too, of um, the staff really starting to branch out, using Google, using a lot of these other online resources, uh, we needed to provide them more bandwidth. New and advanced technology deployment. So in the past couple of years, we have deployed two 3D printers um, down at the middle school. And uh, I think there's two going in at Wentworth. Um, we have dock cameras. We have several different kinds of dock cameras. Some of them are just the basic ladybugs, and some of them are the higher-end hover cams. Uh, we have interactive Eno boards, and we have scanners. We have all kinds of stuff. New and improved communication systems. So you will see, hopefully, we have it scheduled, where at the end of this school year there will be a new website and to communicate with the public. Um, we have rolled out, since 2010, we rolled out a new intranet system so that the internal staff can communicate with each other. And um, we have instituted a new, we've implemented a new telephone system uh, campus-wide. The new, that seems kind of boring, I think, but really the new telephone system is tied into the new PA system, and those are really sort of security focused. This is going to help us. We're all in the same system now. We can really, in an emergency situation, we can, you know, get the word out, contact people. We can see what's going on in the, in the different buildings. Increased remote access, so if you're a parent of a child and you wanted to look at grades, you know that we implemented PowerSchool, so parents and kids like can get online and take a look at their grades. We also moved that, migrated that to the cloud for the teachers last year. And what that did was for the teachers, they used to have to either be on site to input their grades or they used to have to try to dial in from home, which was sort of a clunky, cumbersome system. Now it's in the cloud, anytime, anywhere access, at and for the point of learning, they can go in, they can update grades, they can put in comments, they can communicate with people. We also implemented um, Power Announcer, which is, which is um, interfaced into PowerSchool. So in the case of an emergency snow day, you all probably have gotten the calls the school wouldn't be open or would be open late. Those all came out of Power Announcer. So that whole system is, is integrated. Uh, cloud adoption and migration, and this also hits with remote access, but we really, really have put the push on this year to go Google. And the reason was when I first came on board here, one of the things I heard universally throughout the campus was I can't get to my work from home. The teacher said that, the kids said that, it was a real stumbling block. With Google, I don't know if you all have had a chance to see some of the things that you can do with Google, but you can have, in Google Docs, you can have a group project. Do you guys use it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you can have group projects. You're working on a document. Everybody's on at the same time. It tracks, um, you know, who's commenting on what. Your teacher can then get, get online and uh, grade your papers, make comments on the papers. I mean, do you find it useful? We don't have our teachers go on it, but I do a lot of projects with that, a lot of labs. Is it easier than having to call up and say, hey, everybody meet over here and try to get five people together? <laughs> Um, so we've got cloud adoption for that. There's a couple of other things that we're looking at for cloud adoption, though. There's some great tools out there for teachers. So that gets back to the need for more integrators. 
the integrators really go out, they find these tools, and then they help the teachers to integrate that into the curriculum. Service consolidation and cost efficiencies, and I threw this in because if you have a child at the middle school, you probably have heard about paper cut. Paper cut was something that we rolled out this year, again, getting back to the fact that the middle school suddenly became a completely mobile wireless environment. So now we had an issue of you've got a kid who's got a laptop from the portables going to a class that's in the main building. How are they going to print? Because they're tied to the printer that's in the portable. And if they tried to load another printer, there's I don't know how many of them at the time. So we decided that we were going to actually consolidate the number of printers to reduce our maintenance costs and reduce our licensing costs and reduce our purchase costs. We have about 12 printers school-wide now, loaded with paper cut, and paper cut sounds painful. <laughs> it was kind of painful initially, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, but now I think they love it. We've had fantastic feedback. Um, basically, if you are a student and you want to print something, you just send it to print and you go to any one of the printers and you type in your student ID and you can pull the print job right from there. Our plan is really to roll this out campus-wide. So if you're a student and you go up to the high school, you can pull your print job up there. If you're in central office and you go for a meeting at a K2, you can pull your print job from there. And we found that this actually has reduced the overall maintenance cost, but also operating costs. Because if you think about, if you don't know what printer you're printing to, what we found was people were print, 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 print. We'd get a ream of paper printing out. They still couldn't find their job. So now you know exactly where it's going to print, where you're going to pick it up. So that's just some of, that's an example of one of the projects that we've been working on. And the last thing is cyber safety awareness and training. This is sort of two-pronged. Um, for the cyber safety, we started at the middle school, and this kind of grew out of the parent meetings that we have for the laptops. But we had a request from those parents, can you please, um, you know, I know you have cyber training, cyber awareness training for my kids, but I need help. As a parent, it's, tra it's changing all the time. I, I need somebody to tell me what I should be looking out for. So we started these cyber awareness trainings. Um, the first one I think we had 20, 25 people at. They asked great questions. They, they were you know, gr great group of people. We have been holding them at Wentworth, and we do have plans to roll them out at the high school as well. Um, we, we do go into the classroom. Um, it's Officer Rob Pellerin and myself and Alicia uh, Sorensen Biggs, who's our K-12 tech specialist. On the flip side of that, I have been doing cyber training with the staff as well, and that's been primarily information security focused. Um, I've done a couple of sessions with central office staff and administrative staff, and now I've been going out to the school buildings and doing um, these sessions with the lead teachers and some of the other staff there. So we plan to hopefully expand this as we move forward. We also have created, down at the um, middle school, Alicia Sorensen Biggs, again, has sort of spearheaded this group of um, cyber sleuths. So they're going to call themselves CSI. <laughs> and it's a group of students that are going to come together under the direction of a um, advisory board of staff members at the middle school. And they're going to work on things like helping um, staff to understand some of the cybersecurity issues. They also are going to, there's, Google has a program called Google Ninjas. And through Google Ninjas, you can take all these online courses, and you can become a white belt, a black belt, a green belt in Google, Google Docs. There's all these different courses that you can take in all the different parts of Google and Google Apps. So we're going to have them go through that, and then hopefully we will train an army of ninjas to go out and help the staff with this as well. And interact with the sleuths. And inter well, they are the sleuths. Oh, okay. Yes, they're the CSI. You need a playbook for <laughs> <laughs> So along the same lines, now, so that's sort of our current environment. So where we've been, where we, where we are now, and if we look at where we want to go in the future, these are some of the things that we've been um, trying to outline and plan for. So if you take that group of kids, they're going to be a great group to then kind of move forward through the system. And eventually down the road, I would love to see them become um, in partnership with the community and with the staff. 
So maybe we would have in high school um, internships that would be available to these kids. Maybe we would have volunteer programs where they could go to, for example, Project Grace, work on their computers. It would give them good experience out in the field, and then it would also help the community. So that's kind of where, where we see this going, and hopefully we'll get there in a couple of years. Um, expand the Train the Trainer Classroom Tech Integration. When we rolled out the HPs down at the middle school, we took advantage of the training from the state, the professional development, and the training from HP. And we trained seven of the teachers, we teachers down at the middle school, in various things, very specific programs. So things like um, Office 365, there were a couple of different things that we had. Um, and then they went forward, and in October, we had what we called HP Day. And we had a whole day of training that was in concurrent tracks. I give Alicia all the credit for putting this together because it was a, a bear to put together. But she got the trainers all lined up and all um, organized. She got everybody um, registered for different classes. And they had an entire day of concurrent sessions. We got such fantastic feedback from the whole staff that now we're going to try to expand that district-wide. So hopefully in the coming years we'll have you know, tech training days where we just have all these concurrent tracks running. People can go to the different buildings and attend different sessions. And I should say it wasn't just on HP things. Once people got wind that there were going to be these training sessions, we fortunately had a, a, a handful of people who said, oh, I know something about Google. I want to train on that. Or I know something about, you know, Windows 8. I want to train on that. So it was great. We had we we sort of found this unknown cache of trainers. <coughs> uh, we want to develop immersive and experiential environments. And what I mean by that is, um, I read an article about uh, a teacher who had I think it was in a biology. You read the same article, right, Winnie? It was a biology class or something. And he created this virtual world um, of bacteria. So as students came into this class, you became the bacteria. And in this virtual world, you moved through kind of growing and infecting and, <laughs> you know, whatever bacteria do. Um, but because the, the, the students were so immersed in it, they really started to understand it from the inside out. And that's kind of where we're going with, with giving them the tools to really sort of immerse themselves in the curriculum. Outfit advanced STEM and STEAM offerings, and you know, again, we have right now um, LEGO Robotics. I think you saw a presentation on that last year. So we have LEGO Robotics. We have um, some different uh, basic sort of engineering architectural programs at the middle school. We have the 3D printers that support that, and we have some of the LEGO Robotics programs that support that. But now I'm talking more about getting into a sort of a higher level. When we did the tech refresh at the high school, we rolled out some really advanced, high-powered microscopes. So I'm talking about things like that, being able to offer coding classes, things that will really help the kids post-grad in that STEM and STEAM um, area. Blended learning opportunities is something that we've all been talking about, but the, that ability to really take you know, a, a textbook experience, to take an online experience, to take an out-of-the-classroom experience, and blend them all together to provide that complete, total, cohesive learning experience for the students to prepare them to move on to their to actual jobs. And then one-to-one -one environment and classroom technology. So I mentioned that now we are one-to-one -one at the middle school. Um, and it's been a, a great experience, I think, for both the students and the staff down there. Um, we did do a little survey and we got some great feedback. We will be one-to-one -one at Wentworth. So, and when I say one-to-one, -one, I really mean one access to a device. So every student has access to that device. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's their device to take home. And so now we're looking at potentially one-to-one -one at the high school. Because if you're going one-to-one, -one, three through five, and then you move on and you go one-to-one, -one, six through eight, and it's the same device, when you go to the high school when you're a freshman, you just fall off a technology cliff. There's nothing for you. 
So along those lines, maybe I should stop here. Does anybody have questions about that part, where we've been, where we are? We've stepped out of the way back machine now and we're all, <laughs> okay. Um, so creating a one-to-one -one environment. First of all, I think we need to, we probably need to define one-to-one -one versus BYOD versus BYOD with a virtual desktop interface. We talked about this a little bit at the um, strategic planning session, I think it was last March. So that's why I sort of wanted to circle back around because there were a lot of different ways that we could go with this and I really wanted to research it, make sure that from a cost perspective, from an accessibility perspective, functionality perspective, we were going down the right path. One-to-one -one in this scenario really means providing one device for every student. You can have a BYOD that is one-to-one. -one. So a lot, you'll hear that those two terms used in conjunction with each other. But for our purposes here, it means provide, the, the school district provides that device. BYOD stands for bring your own device. So that's a scenario that other school districts around the country have adopted. Um, when you bring your own device, that could be anything from a laptop to a phone. It, it really means anything. When you think about it, we already have that at the high school. I mean, I don't know if you guys bring your phone. You, know, you can get on the internet there. But if you think about the challenges that that brings along, because if I'm on this, and then I can see that Marissa has an iPad, right? And then if David has a laptop, now we're all on different operating systems. We all have different programs. How am I going to really write a term paper on this. So it really kind of, you know, it presents a lot of challenges. BYOD with VDI, which is a virtual desktop interface, is the way that some of the other schools have gone, and we looked at that as well. A virtual desktop interface basically just means that you take your device, you browse to a desktop interface that the school provides, and that desktop interface has <coughs> the um, applications and the programs that you need that's provided by the school. So it does provide a consistent experience for the end user, but it doesn't take away from the fact that I'm still trying to browse on this. If you look at one-to-one, -one, now we've got, with a, with a district provided device, now everybody's on the same device, everybody's accessing the same programs. I, if somebody says, oh, out of the 20 kids in class and he says, I can't get on, we're not stopping the class, trying to bring in a tech to get that person. We haven't completely ground to a halt. So in looking at the business case for the high school, we looked, that was why we looked at one-to-one. VDI -one. Um, is also extremely expensive to roll out and to get up and running, and then the licensing costs over time are also fairly expensive. Um, consistency across the phases, so again, that concept that you're going to go from grades three through eight already with that HP laptop, so if you're going to have a bring your own device after that, suddenly after you know, six years of the same device, the laptop, being able to access the same things on the same network, suddenly you're not able to. Um, and then we can go through um, some of the cost estimates too, which are actually in the proposals, I'm just going to say that it's roughly $650,000 to go one-to-one. -one. That cost includes the price of the devices and um, device management software that we would need, and then the spares, the extra batteries, things like that. One of the things I want to point out is that last March when we were discussing, should we do one-to-one, -one, should we do BYOD with BDI, we didn't know what the state was going to choose for MLTI. And that makes a huge difference to us because we are able now to get a very, very low cost device, an excellent quality device, very low cost device, and it comes preloaded with much of the software that we would need. So that's why we've sort of said, well, at this point in time, from a cost and functionality perspective, it, it, it's time. It makes sense to go with this solution. I have one question. Is it where we would own the devices, or would this be a lease? No, we would own the devices, yes. Right. I just figured I'd throw that one out there yeah. right away. No, the lease um, is more expensive because when you lease the device through MLTI, 
then you get involved in their network and you get involved in their um, damage protection plan and their professional development and all of that. But we have had talks with HP to kind of see what we could put together in terms of professional development and some other things. Okay. So we're looking into that. So 650K to out uh, to <coughs> set up the high school on a one-to-one -one device. What's the life expectancy of those machines? I'm calling it four years, but we have talked about that a little bit in the proposal. Let, let me introduce you to um, what you've just received here. Um, it, with uh, Jen laying the foundation for um, going from um, a long time ago, way back in 2010, uh, to uh, now 2014, it seemed uh, too much a good opportunity to pass up not to share with you um, this business case. And this is not a proposal in the same format that you see proposals that we create for budget, um, but you can be assured that this will be a budget proposal. You're seeing it more in the form of um, a research report um, that really relates to the accessibility that our high school students have to technology, or in our case, that they actually don't have to technology, um, and um, that access that's so critical to their preparedness for college um, and career. So the business case presents a metho methodological walkthrough on how to best address our current limitations when it comes to technology at the uh, high school. It's an analytical report more so than a new investment proposal, as I just said. You'll have the time to walk through this um, on your own as you walk away with a copy. But right now, we will have a chance to listen to uh, some of our key leaders walk you through the most important components of this business case um, and then and certainly uh, en entertain some questions. So I was just going to go through sort of an implementation overview because I think the next question, I can see Chris looking at me like, how would we actually do this? Well, <laughs> so we, we've gone through in the document that you have, it sort of lays out a lot of the details. But just to give you an overview, so obviously we would have to purchase and acquire these devices. And again, I just want to stress that we've been so fortunate in living this already at the middle school. So we learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> Tuition. <laughs> Tuition, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. we, yeah, definitely. We've, we've learned a lot of lessons. You know, we made a few mistakes here and there. Um, but I think that we really have developed a pretty solid playbook for how to go um, start to finish with this project. There are a few things that are different with this. So we'll kind of go through that. But to so purchase and acquire these. Um, then we would have to image and configure them. So that, you know, we have to go through the high school, try to figure out each class, each phase level, what they need in terms of software for the image. And then we would have to actually image them, configure them, and load them to the network, get them all connected. Um, then David and his team, and probably us on the back end, would have to develop business processes, policies, and procedures for things that we deal with at the middle school all the time, which is um, damage policy, um, a behavior policy, discipline policy, usage, po you know, all that kind of stuff. This would all be running parallel to when we're doing the purchase acquisition imaging and configuration. We could run parallel with the business process um, policy and pr procedure development and along with that, professional <coughs> development. So we've talked about the need for a tech integrator because you really want somebody who's on the front lines of the teachers who knows the curriculum and knows how to use the applications, the software, to the best for the students and, and the staff. And then rolling that out. So we have trained the trainers. We could get assistance from outside. HP actually has rolled out some free training. So there's all kinds of resources. And then collectively, we would have deployment. Um, again, we've been through this many times at the middle school with the HPs. We went through this this, this past fall. Um, you know, deployment is probably a month or two long process, but you do get through it. <laughs> and then maintenance and cycle replacement. So in that document, you'll say, you know, we have thought about how would we maintain these? We would buy these devices with accidental damage protection on them. So essentially, they would be covered. Um, bumper to bumper warranty for three years. And then 
cyclically, we would have to figure out what do, how do we want to cycle these in and out. And then I'm going to let Monique know. Or Dave. David. <laughs> talk to you about, do you want this? Do you want me to? Uh, yeah, okay. I can take it. Thank you. So, uh, part of what you hear from me might be um, repetition. There might be some things that Jen's already pointed out, but what we wanted to share with you was some, uh, some of the specifics in terms of how it's going to impact the student learning at the high school. And so, one of the things that Jen did mention is it provides consistency with your curriculum and instruction. So, every student and teacher has the same device. And that consistency is across the board. And, and we we see that as a, a key feature. When she was talking about BYOD, the difficulties and challenges in creating lessons when you have multiple devices in your classroom compared to everybody having the same device. And teachers have had these devices for a few years, at least two. And so they're comfortable with those devices. Uh, secondly, to make sure you have the most current and accurate information. So probably the nicest way to say that is no outdated textbooks. You know, if you're in a classroom where you've got 12-year-old, 10-year-old textbooks, you're in a history class, there's a lot of history in the last 12 years that have occurred. So it would ensure that we'd have the most current and accurate information at the disposal for our students. The other piece is utilizing interactive web-based sites. And that's what some of our department heads are already doing, and I did this in another school that I worked at. Picture having um, a classroom textbook, say, for instance where it's one set of classroom texts per teacher. And all the students come in, and when they're in school, they have access to that if they need that, and they learn best that way. But then we have websites directly linked to that textbook where they have subscriptions, and it's an online subscription. And those websites also provide the opportunity for all the users, which includes the teacher and the students, to go in. Teachers can create assessments, review sheets. They can tailor and make what, what they want students to do. And students can access all that outside of school by using their one-to-one -one devices. Um, enhancing teaching strategies, and I think it's kind of alluded to it up above. If you have limited resources in the classroom, materials that you've purchased to the textbook or whatever, just think of the resources that you have when you go and you can, and you can access the Internet. And teachers, it, they would be able to enhance current strategies. They can still use some of those strategies that are effective in the classroom but you're able to enhance those when, when you have the one-to-one -one technology. And then um, one of the things that I, that's a big sell for me is that, and I, people, when people hear me talk about this, I mention my daughters all the time, this is a natural part of how students learn now. My children are so comfortable at the age of 11 and 13 with using technology. I mean, often the times they're showing me, hey, try this on a PowerPoint. Have you ever done this? And so students are comfortable with it. They're interested in it. It's a way to be creative. It's exciting to them to use that device. And if that's one of the tools that we have for students to learn, just think how that's going to excite a student when they're going through something in a lesson as opposed to flipping open a textbook and taking notes. Um, let me change the channel. Uh, in addition to that, I don't think I'm all set now. When you think about increasing access to courses outside of the school, one of the best things we can do for our students is just not confine them to what we offer at Scarborough High School. What can we do outside? Talk about preparing students for a global society. Being able to interact, being able to take VHS classes, being able to take, uh, speak to and communicate with people from other countries and from other schools. One-to-one -one provides that for you. Um, another big sticking point for me is um, you have technology to say that you're a third grader next year and you have one-to-one -one. and you go through all those years of being comfortable with technology and then you walk into the high school and you don't have that technology or you don't have teachers who are tapping into that resource on a regular basis. You might have your own laptop or your phone or whatever, but it's not a part of the normal learning process where you can pull it out and use it as a tool. And that transition from the middle school to the high school significantly changes if we provide one-to-one. -one. We can enhance and continue down the road that they're already on. Um, customized assessment ties to proficiency-based learning. So when you talk about proficiency-based learning, which is, I guess, hard for me to say, you, you, you have to provide students with opportunities to be reassessed, to have extra practice, to look at models that will help them learn how to do it differently. When you have access to technology, 
you have so many more opportunities and a wealth of resources to do that, that when we do have to go to participatory-based learning, I think it's going to be a great tool for us. And then there are a lot of schools that are exploring this, and, and I think there are some schools that currently have this tied to their diplomas. It's the potential to add endorsements to a diploma. So picture, for instance, we have the ability for kids to be involved with a STEM initiative or an engineering initiative, and it's a pathway that they choose to take. And because of technology, they have access to resources outside of Scarborough High School that allows them to have a focus in that area. We attach that as an endorsement onto their um, diploma. Global studies, the arts, Jim was referring to STEM and STEAM. If you integrate advanced courses in arts with the STEM concept, that's where you get your STEAM. Um, do I have more? I think that's it. So it, we just tried to highlight for you just a few of the examples of what one-to-one -one could do for you. I think a key point to remember through all of this is that we need to really do a good job of preparing our teachers for a transition into this, and we've talked about that. That's going to be our responsibility in terms of how we roll it out. But teachers need to be provided the opportunity for professional development and to learn how to integrate technology, and that's where the high school technology integrator would be crucial if we did go one-to-one. -one. Thank you. In terms of a return on this investment, this is an investment we're going to be investing, looking to invest, into 21st century devices. We want our students to have and build those 21st century skills. Um, we're looking to invest in 21st century devices. Certainly the first and foremost is that college and career readiness. We worked with, David and I spoke with the board um, a couple of meetings ago around the proficiency-based diploma and around student-centered learning. Um, making that investment in these computing devices allows us to reach those goals. In addition to the continuity that David spoke about, there's also an equity issue. Yeah, we could continue on with the um, bring your own device model, but we have students who cannot afford a device. And so it would provide equity of access for all of our students. In addition to that student-centered learning piece where we could provide educational opportunities which would be uh, more personalized, pursuing, allowing students to pursue their interests and their needs. There's also value for the dollar in terms of this return. It would certainly minimize paper costs and print resources it, and textbook replacement but it would also maximize our dollar. We have district-wide subscriptions now that our students can't access because they don't have the, the devices to do so. So in terms of return on our investment, we feel it's a very good investment. In terms of uh, the risks involved, if we don't invest now, there are several. Uh, our greatest worry is that our students won't be competitive when they leave us from Scarborough High School. There isn't a career or a college that doesn't require the use of a computer or a computing device. And those students who are competitive know how to use those effectively. We want to provide our students with that opportunity. Uh, we also have a window of opportunity in terms of value. We have this statewide negotiated computer price for computer devices. Price is going up next year. So we will miss that window of opportunity. Things are going to get more expensive in terms of the device. Certain learning resources won't be available. Many print resources are no longer available. They're being digitized. In addition to that, the statewide testing that's coming down the pipe will be online. So there is a bit of an in inevitability around providing students with a computing device. Now the cost of learning increases those textbooks, because printing textbooks is becoming increasingly more expensive. That's going up, while the quality of the learning decreases. If we can provide our students with a digital textbook, it provides the opportunity for students to access primary sources, resources, interactive sites. It's a much more rich learning experience. And if our mission really is to prepare our students for the future, much of which is unknown, if we don't provide students with devices to enable that to happen, we're really going to continue to prepare students for the past. And I think I. At this point, I'd like to um, turn it over to David for right. conclusions. Is that nice save? So, <laughs> so the conclusions, we, you know, there's been a lot of information that we've shared with you. So I was going to try to be clever, but it backfired because you didn't do what I thought we would do. I thought I would come in and everyone would have their laptops open and their phones out and you'd be using your technology. And what I was going to say to you is, 
close your laptops, put them down, take your phones, put them away, and now I'm going to ask you to take notes and communicate with each other, and you can't use those. And that's what happens to our freshmen now when they come to the high school. So that's the piece Monique mentioned a minute ago in terms of the equity for students and the continuity and being able to have the devices that you become accustomed to and you're very good at. And again, I'm going to use my daughter for an example. My 13-year-old has her iPad next to her and she is so good at accessing information and using it as a tool that when she goes to the high school, if she couldn't have that, it's really going to change the game for her. And it doesn't mean that there aren't things that are of value that she can learn in the classroom in terms of other ways. But it's such a valuable tool. Can you imagine if you had those taken away from you as an adult, and that's how you typically work for years, and all of a sudden you didn't have access to it? That's what our students are going through. Increase in personalized learning opportunities for all students. The two most important words to me are all students. We get an opportunity to provide all students with technology. Every single student has a chance to go down perhaps a pathway that because they have access to technology, they might not be able to go down if they just were going through what we have in the, co the confines of Scarborough High School. Preparing students to compete in the 21st century, that's the knowledge and skills base, which we've already discussed how much technology can enhance that piece. And if you talk to any student that's in college now or has gone, gone into the real world and the jobs that they have, they, their ability to be able to compete in the 21st century, a lot is tied to their ability to use technology as a resource. Communication as a resource for information. And then finally, ensure the students are prepared for a global society. What better way to understand and communicate with what's happening in the rest of the world than through technology? If we don't have that, it's very difficult to ensure students can have that. So there were four highlights that we thought would be keys to part of the reasons why we think it would directly impact student learning at Scarborough High School. And now, I think. Questions? No questions. Uh, question, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll get you. My hand was up first, but go ahead. No, no. Oh, oh, I, will, I, I look I, this I way see. first, because uh, you I, know I, how he is. No, go I'll ahead, first. <laughs> They're outnumbered. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I think it's an easy sell for this board. To, um, to convince us that one-to-one -one computing is necessary at the high school. I think it's a goal we've had for some time. I think it's a long time coming. Um, my, my, my challenge with this process is that $672,000 price tag in one lump sum. And um, so I, I'm, I guess there's a, the, that sets the stage for a couple of my questions. How long is the contract with HP? Well, there's, there wouldn't be any contract with HP because we're just purchasing them. But if the so if, if we were to lease them through the state, it would be four years. But if we're just outright purchasing them, we're done. But the, re so the how long is the negotiated reduced price good for, I guess, is probably the better question. Um, it's, it, it's all over now. It is. I spoke with them, and I can get that price, but pretty much just right now through the end of this fiscal year. Small window. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, what kind, what, how much of a price difference are we talking? Are we talking, uh, you know, 10%? Are we talking double? Are we talking... It, it's about $70 per device. More. Okay. Um, is it, would it be feasible to do some kind of phase installation or in, installment, meaning maybe we get the freshman sophomore classes, that way we could put the, more, the devices on, let's say, a rotating type of maintenance or a rotating replacement schedule and do it in smaller sections. Is, I mean, I know that presents a whole other set of challenges. I'm looking at it purely from the financial standpoint of trying to, to minimize that cost impact in one lump sum. We talked about that internally, and I have an answer, but David... She's got the financial <laughs> answer. The, the educational answer is, as you know, how many ninth graders are taking courses that are also with sophomores or juniors or whatever. So if we had just freshman classes and just sophomore classes, educationally that would work. But there's too much of a combo player at the high school. So educationally that would be difficult just to give one grade the technology and not have the others exposed to it. Actually, I, just to jump off of that, I've seen that at the middle school already because now that sixth graders have laptops, they can't take them home which I'm not sure what the reason for that is, but they spend all day doing their work on their laptop 
doing their assignments, they have to finish them at home. Not everyone has a device at home, or some people have two kids and one computer, right. like in my house. So somebody's up doing their homework later. So when you spend all day doing it, and when you're in a multi-age environment and the whole class is using the laptops and seventh and eighth graders can take them home, sixth graders can't, well, there goes all the work you just did. You either have to fight over the home computer or your handwriting at home. So it starts and stops. It's not, not very fluid. And from a, a technical perspective, it would be very difficult to operate in a mixed environment like that because then you would have, you know, if you did it in thirds, you would have a portion of devices that would be hitting end of life at different times and you would have, you know, different operating systems, you would have different components yeah. probably. So but my concern is having to replace 1,037 laptops every three time. years or every four years. I mean, that's just, that's a, that, that would be difficult to swallow. And, you know and we, I mean? We're still talking about what that's going to look like. It doesn't necessarily have to be a wholesale swap out. Mm -hmm. It could be a cyclical um, refresh. Okay. It could be, you know, and I mean, we've talked about everything from potentially selling the seniors their device to, you know, every two years swapping out to, you know, redeploying those de devices elsewhere in the district. So we. We are, we're looking at a lot of different potentials, and I am talking to different vendors to kind of, you know, get their input, um, I, trying to find out what other school districts do as well. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I got a couple more, and then I'll, then I'll be done for the day. The high school integrator, is it, it, rather than, it sounds like that would be creating a new position. Um, is it possible? to shift that resource from the middle school short term during the phase up or during the implementation and then have some kind of shared resource. I don't know if that's possible, but I'm just trying to figure out a, 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 a way to package it up and, and, and get the most we can with the least amount. You know what I mean? Bang for your buck. Yeah, okay. That, that wasn't my uh, yeah. Well, the, the integrator at the middle school is really point four. Yes, I believe it's point four. But I mean, even increasing that to, let's say, a full-time position would be better than creating an entire new one, one zero position, if we could do it. I, I mean, yeah. I'm just trying to look at different ways instead of creating a new infrastructure that we, you know, we have to have four, more, four brand new full-time positions to supplement this program. If, if there's some way we can share resources a little bit to help yeah. lower that, would be helpful. Can I, can, I, sorry, can, yeah, I, can I get part of that? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that would help with the financial piece to it, but picture 150 staff members perhaps 30 are savvy in technology. Now you've got 120, maybe 100, let's say, who are now going to be asked to integrate technology. The amount of time that it takes to go out and look at those websites and look at those tools and look at those resources, if you have somebody that can come and work with them and have done that leg work and can go in and instantly show them, yeah, eventually you're going to have a skill set within each department or content area where people are comfortable with that and they can help the, the rest. But initially, for the first few years, you're going to have over 100 staff members that need help integrating. Yeah, and my thought was, I, I don't know how it's progressed at the middle school, whether that person, now that they're up to speed after a few years, if they can start right. to scale back a little bit. Right. I don't know. I don't know yeah. what, that, what that entails, Good but question. if that's possible, maybe something to look at. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I, don't, I look at this as continuous improvement in terms mm -hmm. of the staff, there are always going to be technological advancement. There are always going to be uh, learning opportunities on the web. I see the role of a tech integrator as someone who is out there on the cutting edge, looking, evaluating, figuring out, uh, translating so that teachers it, it can spend their time planning good instruction. And it really does, as David said, saves that time, that research time on the part of teachers. So if we're going to stay ahead of the curve in terms of preparation for the future, I think we, it, it's, it's good investment in our dollars to have someone who helps make that a much more efficient process for our teachers so they can focus on the delivery of the instruction piece. So I don't see the tech integrator, yeah, there's a high learning curve at the beginning, but my hope is that they're still infusing new innovative practices and resources all the time within a system. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm yes. trying to avoid the perception that we're creating a, a new infrastructure now Absolutely. to support a new process with new costs and new expenses without having some kind of, of you know, an end student 
Absolutely, much appreciated. It, it's one of those situations where we're we're trying to catch up to resources that other districts have. Right. Um, and, and to strike a balance in terms of the investment that you make in the devices, and how, at what point do you sort of fall short of the investment in terms of the the learning piece for the adults that you're not really maximizing. The, the impact of the investment. You know, your point's a good one, and it's really, it's a fine balance piece, and I think that we certainly, we certainly are sensitive to that. That brings me to the last segue. That was a good segue in the last well, one. Well, we practiced that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good cue, actually. Um, um, I, I, there were a lot of general statements about where we could save money and how we could save money. I, I'd like to see, if we go this route, I'd like to have Kate or somebody do a cost analysis of, and get some kind of projected savings that we can look at. I mean, I don't expect it to be offsetting by any stretch of the imagination, but just some tangible number that we can point to and say, we're anticipating X number of dollars in savings, whether it's textbooks, whether it's paper, however, and the bigger number we can get out of that savings, the easier it's going to be for us to package this up and, and present it to the, to the community for sure. And, and then I'm done. That, that would be part of the... Uh, the, the real proposal, as we said, this is a business case that gives you a good sense of our thinking and the component pieces that we've already looked at. Jackie's been waiting patiently. Marissa, when did your sister graduate from high school? 2010. 2010. In 2010, <laughs> during the budget process during 2010, this board had one-to-one computers in the budget for the high school. And I think the cost at that point was 750000 sticks in my mind. Three things happened. One, the students at the high school, including your sister, said they didn't want one-to-one. -one. They wanted to be able to use their own laptops. Am I correct? Maybe, I just don't recall. So the students on this Board of Education came in and said, the students at the high school don't want this. Second thing that happened was a very prominent woman in this community who had two very bright sons who graduated from our high school came up to the microphone and she said, my son is at such and such polytech and says, you don't need to have a computer in high school. Oh, you'll, they'll teach you how to use it when you get to college. And thirdly, the town council said, that's too much money. Uh, figure out some other way to get those devices into the high school. So here's our challenge. Number one, we have to convince the students it's in their best interest so they can convince their parents that it's in their best interest. Number two, we have to have the backing of former students who say, yeah, I wish I had this when I had been in high school because it really would have helped me in my learning and would have helped me integrate into college a little easier. And thirdly, we are going to have to convince our town council that this is the best learning for our students, that this is the way we have to go to improve, and we're late already. So I challenge our students to find out, is this in fact necessary at the high school in their own minds? and get the support of their fellow students and thus the parents. And we will have to convince the public and the town council. I've been fighting for technology for our school district since we opened the middle school. And at that point I said, and I was laughed at by the way, that every teacher in our school district should have a computer on their desk. That's when the first technology committee was formed in this town. And even the superintendent laughed at me at that point. Am I correct, Joanne? 16 years ago, 17 years ago. I'll fight for this. 
as long as the students can back it and the parents will back it, I'll fight for it again. But it's going to be a fight, I can tell you that. Funny to say that even the students didn't want it. Then mm. Jackie. Began That's correct. It. It's so. I think it's hard for people who maybe have been in their same job, doing their same job for 20 years, because maybe they've always had a computer, and the computer on their desk sometimes comes and goes. A new one will come, but their job kind of stays the same. And maybe the way they do it has changed a little bit over 20 years, but nothing has changed as fast as education. Nothing in the last 20 years. And the way people access information and the way you're required to access information. When I was in law school from 97 to 2000, there was a brand new law school. They it just opened right before I got in there. They had plugs only on the walls of the big lecture hall. And so we, I used to call it Silicon Valley because there'd be right up against the wall, everyone would sit from the top down to the bottom would have a laptop. Only those people could have a laptop because you had to plug them in because batteries didn't last so long. So they were the only ones. They were all behind the laptops all the time. And we were all, you know, just handwriting our notes, and that was fine. And then, <coughs> you know, as the years went by, the valley grew a little bit, and, like, it got deeper into the room. Technology had improved. Batteries were better. You didn't have to be plugged in all the time. And there were things you could be looking up, because now there was Internet that was more than just, like, a few companies having websites. And I could see it as it was going along. And now, in my job... I am part of a group that chooses curriculums for things, and we have one curriculum that's book-based, and we have one that we found that is completely internet-based. It costs maybe a tenth of what it costs to buy the book curriculum, and it's 1,000 times more interesting and has links to artwork that you can pull into it. It has click here for a YouTube video with music that will be narrated, and you can see how that all ties into what we're talking about. It has um, video clips here you can access for um, a story. And it just, the amount of material that you can get for so much less money, it's mind-blowing. We still have the books because we don't have Wi-Fi through the whole building. So we do have um, the books for most of the kids. But I think we're moving more towards the online curriculum because it costs so much less and it's so much richer. There's so much more for... Um, just broadening the same lesson could be taught from the book, and it would be fine. But what you can get from the online curriculum just because of what's available to you, it's unbelievable, the difference. And it's not even, it's not even fair, really. Mm -hmm. I feel bad for the kids that just have the books because yes. the other kids are getting a completely different education. Different education. And if, if I could piggyback on that just real quick, and it would bring to your point about the students. If I haven't experienced the opportunity to have my education the way she just described, I might not know the benefits to it. I know there are teachers at the high school right now that do use technology at times, and when they're limited on what they can use, their students notice that and wish that they were able to have that access all the time. So some students might not just have had the opportunity to be exposed to some of the great teaching strategies and resources you can give from one-to-one. -one. It's hard for them to know if they haven't had it exposed to them. It's been four years. Let's see what happens. Well, and we, and we joked when Jen said way back in 2010, but really, way back, yeah. right, computer-wise and technology-wise, it is way back in 2010. And the cloud, like, the whole idea of the cloud wasn't as, you know, used as much as it is now. I mean, my third grader knows about the cloud. And, you know, four years ago, as an adult, I'm still wondering, you know, why are they talking about this cloud? How does that work? What is this all about? Mm -hmm. four years. It's, it's interesting you say about the, you know, your textbook is online. It's um, coming that way where, so if something changed six months from now, it could be instantly changed in that textbook because right. you're accessing it as you're going. Mm -hmm. And I was at a curriculum meeting earlier today, and uh, at the beginning of our meeting, someone said, oh, and if you, you know, need some more information, you can just access it online, and I sat there and I said, darn it, I left my iPad at home, and I whipped out my phone, and I sent a message back home to my husband, and I said, hey, I left my iPad plugged in, can you drop it off the town hall? 
and 20 minutes later he was here and I was able to pull up information that we didn't necessarily have from the items that we were looking at right then and it was great because you could go right to the website, you could find out what kind of professional development was available, what kind of other things were accessible, and, and so on. So it certainly is definitely a help even in day to day where I didn't have it when I was a child, but now I can get it in two seconds. Mm -hmm. There was also talk four years ago that uh, it would be difficult to keep everything charged because there were so many. Has that problem been overcome? The laptops that have been rolled out at the middle school, one of the requirements in the RFP was that they maintain a charge all day. But we do have you know, charging stations available, limited numbers where we just charge the batteries and we can pop them out and replace them if necessary. Donna, um, Well, first of all, let me thank you for the presentation because you all did quite a bit of work on this, putting this all together, and it was really well done because it captured every aspect mm -hmm. to me of why we need technology for our students. And um, so that's my first thing. Um, to Kelly's point, it, it's, and it would not only be the opportunity to access that course that's online, but for a teacher to access numerous texts that have similar programs. So it's really wide open. Um, what's frustrating for me is that it wasn't since 2010. I said it before, and I hate to have to say it again, but you know, the Apple offer was what, 12 years ago? And many towns in this state bought that one-time offer from Apple, and we didn't. So now here we are, this many years later, and our kids have never, all these kids that have graduated since then, 12 years ago, didn't have this opportunity. And now we're looking at you know, an opportunity that faced us this year that was $70 less than what it's going to be next year. So at some point, we have to really sell this. We have to sell this, not just to the town council, and I'm not sure it has to be sold to the town council, um, but certainly to the parents in this town, of which only 20% of the residents are, have kids in the school. So it's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be a, a really good sell. Um, I think that the integrator part of this is like absolutely key because schools are really insulated <laughs> and they're insulated in a way that's very different from the business world. Um, and I, I, I worry that even if we get the technology, if we don't have that integrator, and I, I'm not even thinking one is enough. You've got to have those people that, that have, the key part is in how do you take that content and utilize technology as a tool for the content. That, that's the difference, and that's what that integrator attempts to do with teachers who are more reluctant with using technology or say they don't have the time, when can they put the time in to do the professional development. So I was thinking about e even looking at the PLCs as a way, at PLTs as a way, you know, when, when this new evaluation system for teachers comes out, it's going to mean that teachers have to write a goal. They have to write some goals in certain areas within this evaluation program that's going to come out. And if, into, if utilizing technology could be kind of a district-wide effort that everyone has to set one goal in this area here. Because this is where this town and this school board is headed. Because we have a lot of traction. We, we, we're way behind so many, many districts in this state have so much more. It may mean, you know, David, bringing up somebody from Kennebunk High School, some of the kids, to do, put, put on a, uh, a little presentation 
to the students if we really have to sell it to the kids, although I, I'd be really surprised if that's still the case, but it might be, I might be wrong. Um, bring in a couple of teachers, you know, or take, the, take your best teachers in the district to do a presentation that really digs deeper into uncovering all the layers of what's possible for, for our kids and our, and our teachers. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's incredible right now. I can't imagine what it'll be in another five or ten years. So I guess, you know, if we all work together to try to recognize that if we don't do this this year, and are we looking at it two years from now? Are we looking at it five years from now? Are we looking at it ten years from now? It's always going to be more. It's always going to be there, and it's always going to cost more. And our kids, in the meantime, are going to get further behind and further behind and further behind because they, don't, they won't be able to compete with the other kids going into the colleges. That's the bottom line. They won't have the technology. It has to be about all kids having it. It has to be one-to-one, -one, not bring your own device. So I'm really thrilled that, that that's what we'd be looking at here because it has to be everybody. Um, How do they do? Take it on the road. I was going to say, I know that Marissa, I think you've been waiting. So um, jump in there. I can see why a lot of students wouldn't want this still. Um, like, oh, like there's more important things to spend money on. If the teachers aren't going to use it correctly, blah, blah, blah. Um, but on the other hand, I can see how it can be amazing if it's done correctly. And um, so, so you really do need to win over the students. And I'm just thinking, like, for example, in my physics class, we it, it's a really great class, but class, but we do the same type of learning every day. And if we were to have something like some sort of tutorial about what it could be like how like we don't just have to learn about physics like memorizing like theorems and stuff like that and then practice it in the lab and the next day same thing. We could like oh like try an online tutorial and then like watch someone else doing it in some like larger world perspective in the real life or a bunch of different types of learning styles which really can like make things more interesting. I can see that students would really like that because it would make their school day much more exciting. Right. So anything like that. And then also, this is kind of uh, like a different idea, um, but it seems like every so often, it's like five years later, oh, we got to like update our technology. Oh, another five years later, like we got to catch up again. Um, I think really like putting some more um, value into the, like the student's perspective and like what's going on and like making students feel like they want change and stuff like that could be really important and that way it's like they're making us move forward no matter what and um, for example like I'm a part I like play a role in TED I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of it and it's really inspired me to just let be like to think of new ideas and not just like accept what's going on and if something like that, like students, if other students thought like that, and, and there's definitely ways, I know like um, a few other schools have like TED clubs or like mm -hmm. dean clubs or whatever, um, that could be a way to help students like feel an importance in moving forward. Do you think there'd be students who would say, well, uh, I don't want it because that's going to be a lot more work for me and now I'm going to have to do it at home? Um, I guess I personally, I don't think it would almost be more work, but some parts of it is just, like, logistically, if my math textbook is online, like, sometimes there's not going to be times where I'm going to be at my house able to access the home computer if I'm at a friend's house, if I have, like, a sports game and I'm, like, at an away game, I would do my math homework during, like, the JV field hockey games all the time, but that wouldn't give me the opportunity to be able to do my homework then and get it done in like a reasonable amount of time and then if every single class's homework is online then that's just like all the more time that kind of we have to be kind of like locked up at home on that computer. Mm -hmm. and, and I see it a little differently as a parent of, I now have a senior, but when she left eighth grade, her and a lot of her friends looked at the parents and said, 
well, gee, I had this laptop now mm. in all these grades, and mm. <laughs> what am I going to do when I get to the high school? Mm -hmm. I need a device. How are we going to fix this? And I said, well, you know, Christmas is around the corner, <laughs> and, you know, until then, you're going to need to share, and we're going to need to work things out because you have another sibling, like Kelly says, you know, who's sharing that same home computer. And we did buy a laptop, and I know a lot of the friends that first year got a laptop. So I think that, and they're all different devices, because we went Apple, other people said, you know what, we're not willing to pay the 1600 or the 1500 or the $1,300. We are going to go Dell. We're going with a, you know, 400 or a $500, like, entry level kind of a thing. So I think that having the devices be the same and be consistent and be everybody equally, I think, would be a huge help. And I think it will open up the world. So I see that James had her hand up there first. And uh, I, get, I just got a question. I, I'm kind of uh, technical here. Um, the three-year extended warranty, um, from my personally speaking, you know, $400 laptop, I would never pay $100 for, uh, war, you know, and it's because technology just changed so fast. Now, actually, laptop probably drop price every year, even though this this project, you know, this particular one going up $60, $70 next year, but they are going to be competition, new ones coming out. And they were going to drop in prices, you know, just every, remember this, some kind of rule, every two years is double the speed. So another thing is we charge, you know, we ask parents in middle school to pay that $25 per year for the warranties. Is that some kind of expense that can be shifted to, to the parents instead of pay out of our, you know, our own? Um, we've, we've talked about that. I mean, that will probably end up in the proposal piece of it. This was just to give really sort of a high-level estimate of what we could do. Let me point out, though, that well, we are we're working on the $102, but the $102 includes its accidental protection. So it's not just your standard <coughs> warranty where if something malfunctions in the motherboard, then we're going to get it replaced. Accidental protection covers screen cracks, mm -hmm. liquid spills drops, so all the things that, you know, potentially kids do with their laptops. <laughs> That's yes. the kind of, like, the 25 I'm paying for my sixth graders to cover those kind of, you know, issues. Yes. So that sounds like it's going to be shifted, you know, to the parents instead of paid out by school board, right? School uh, system. That's possible. That's up for review. Um, another thing is that you have the charging station at $1,000 each. And we have five of them, ten packets. What? How many charging stations that actually that comes up 50. to? That would be that, So we had five. So it would charge fifty, 50 batteries. Fifty batteries. So right. the kids going to don't they deeply charged almost every day? I mean, a thousand. Well, they'll have chargers, mm -hmm. and so when they go home, they'll charge them. This is these are just emergency batteries. If somebody forgot to charge theirs, or you know. Um, was away or left it at school, or, you know, something happened and they weren't able to charge it, we would have emergency backups. And um, I was thinking about what Chris was talking about, a phase, um, uh, as you say, that because it could be different operation system or different machines, but from uh, HP perspective, you know, it's all Windows, and uh, if you order a new machine, you can always ask them to install the software or operation system you want them to do. Even now, you know, if you want to buy a, you know, instead of Windows 8, you can still ask for Windows 7. So technically, that's, uh, I mean, I don't see the chan technical challenge to do that if we do it, you know, a different phase that cuts the, because, you know, what we, our budget is really tight, you know, for the past couple of years. And having this, you know, if we can divide it into piecemeal, it would be not easier to absorb in the budget time. So that's what. It's not so much the operating systems. I mean, we could potentially take systems and run them in compatibility mode, which sometimes works with applications and sometimes it doesn't. We've had issues in the past. We do have some machines now that we have to run in compatibility. So it's not so much that I'm concerned with. It's mostly the components. It's getting the, the pieces if we had to, because we, we do have a plan if we had that many HPs. We have a plan to um, go through the training. There's HP training that's offered at no cost. You can become HP certified technicians. 
So we have plans for some of our folks to go through that and be able to repair them on site. But now, you be t if let's say you phased it in over four years, now you're talking about four different models. For example, the model, the 4440 that was rolled out at the middle school in October mm -hmm. is now the 440, and it's a unibody. So it's a different, you're going to get those different models. You're going to have four different years of different models. If you do two, I mean, normally actually the laptop is getting smaller, thinner, so next time you're probably getting a better deal, you know, better product for probably the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is, um, you know, I know if the whole school roll up at the same time, the supporting issue, like we talked about the integrator, you know, the teachers don't, I mean, going to have to spend a lot of time learning the new system, integrate that into the, you know, the, the teaching or experience, and I just, you know, afraid that we spend the money and not, not every teacher is really, in terms of technology, to, you know, can keep up with every, you know, the youngsters, and and are we going to get maximum benefit out of this? Uh, so those kind of, you know, like what she was saying, you know, as the kids, uh, we need to use them, you know. Um, why would the art, a kid who is very interested in sports and very interested in art, we have different needs for the student versus somebody who is a like, son, yes, he cannot leave a laptop, that's why he carry on every day to his school. That's, you know, so if he probably wants, you know, wants, well, he, if he needs one, he already have one. Of course, not everybody can do that. But we can provide, if we can select, you know, provide certain amount of, for certain classes. Like this, this money can be spent on, you know, having a, a, another teacher teaching a coding class. Seems like we, if we stretch ourselves so thin because we come, you know, invest in technology such big chunks of you know, money, and we won't have none left for other initiatives. Uh, that is another one of my concerns. So how are we going to take this, you know, step by step is, you know, really I think it needs to be careful, so. Are you? Yeah, I'm done. So then Joanne, what's well, I just wanted to comment about um, many of our high school teachers have not had the one-to-one -one environment to teach, and the integrators would be really important. But at, our, at the um, new teacher breakfast that uh, Dr. Tristel had in November, we, one of two of the new teachers said one of the challenges that they found was coming to Scarborough High School and not having one to one. They felt like they had gone back and teaching. And so there you have teachers who came to our school system who were used to a one to one environment and really felt the difference in their teaching. They've, ha they've had to basically rethink Think. everything. And those and are the teachers we're trying to attract. <laughs> yeah. Right. Our right. our innovative people who have those ideas from other places. Exactly. And so we're and sort so of sh shooting ourselves in the foot with that. Yeah. Right. Some of our teachers, you know, do not know what the next step is because they haven't been in that environment. And a lot of times, when the students do get the one to one one to one environment, they help push the teachers because they want to use those devices. And then the integrators come in, and that's where it's really crucial that we have. <laughs> and that's why it's important that we have integrators to support the teachers. Yeah, because eventually you're going to have people who are not interested in working in Scarborough any longer. <laughs> why would they? They don't have what they've been used to. They don't have what they've trained with in college. Yeah. They don't have what, what they are prepared to utilize. And we'd be asking them to step light years behind. That's right. That's what they told them. Who wants to work here? Yeah. Jackie? Yes. Uh, you may not have this information right tonight, but it's information that we will need, and that is what was our last textbook adoption and how much did it cost? In which... Um, Doesn't matter. It, whether it was math or science. At the high school or it, any grade? If I, could, I don't care. If I could, it doesn't matter. When, when we have done a textbook adoption, for example, when we've implemented, uh, what was that reading program, 10 or 15? I don't remember. But it was expensive. It was very expensive. So that's number one. Number two, 
Kristen, did I understand you to say that it was more difficult to do your homework if you had your computer with you? Or well, I don't have access to like a portable computer. I don't have a laptop that I could use. And if all my homework's online, yeah, it would be more difficult um, to do it sometimes. But not if you had this. You'd take that with you. But, but even then, if I'm on, like, the Thornton Academy turf field, I'm not going to have yeah. internet access. But there's Wi-Fi well, covering a lot of this campus. You can be sitting... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I see what you're saying. Good question. You might not have Wi-Fi when you're sitting right. in a field yeah. trying to do homework during a JV game. So you can't log on. But I thought of that while we were sitting here. You could do screenshots of the math textbook, you know, pages that you have to do when you would do not have Wi-Fi. Or you can just download. That's just the mom telling you, you can get your homework done. You're yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So I need to go to mine now. Yeah, but I think that's Be prepared. Well, wait a minute. That, that does bring up a good point, and I, this isn't the reason not to do it, but there, there should be some kind of mechanism or mythology in place, methodology in place that if there is no Internet access at the person's house or for whatever reason, there has to be a way to download the information at school or something, bring it home, have it stored on that device, so it doesn't... So some way that it's not constantly cloud-based, yeah. I'm sure there's some mechanism we can come into place where you can download it or something at, at before you go home right. and then have it on your device. Um, I, I would ask the student representatives, um, what do you think the best way to roll it out for the students would be? I mean, not that obviously you guys are going to get a whole lot of input, I know, but um, just kind of curiosity of, of, I mean, we all know as adults, we see all these benefits to teachers and continuity and things like that. What, do you guys see any benefit to this in your in your regular coursework, classwork, you know, working with other students? Or I think it kind of almost depends. Because um, in like some classes, such as like English class, I can see so many like applications for a laptop with, you know, we've done stuff already where we're collaborating in groups and like sharing Google documents and everything. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm sitting there in math class, if I, I can't like take notes on a laptop of like equations or kind of like do stuff like that. Um, so uh, like it, it's going to be difficult to kind of see some of the applications in some of the classes that the laptops or like devices could be used for. I can see some opportunities just because I we've discussed some flipped classrooms kinds of things and things like that, but accessing something, say, like you say, you've got an issue in your math class, you know, the Khan Academy or something where if you needed an extra resource to help you with something, it's certainly there for you. And actually, one of the PLTs did that last year. One of the PLTs um, developed online training materials, so they had students who were at the whiteboard actually going through and solving the problems, and they filmed them, and then they loaded them to YouTube. Right. So kids, when they were at home, if you got stuck, you could log on to that YouTube channel, and you could see how to actually solve the problem. Mm -hmm. the, the other piece is, as we've done adoptions, for example, in the math piece, there's an online component to that we haven't tapped into because we don't have the access to the computers. Mm -hmm. uh, even in 2010, even paper publishers were also publishing uh, interactive whiteboard activities. Our elementary math program has interactive whiteboard activities. We don't have interactive whiteboards to access and to leverage that. Mm -hmm. So we already have, uh, by virtue of purchasing that print book, online pieces that we aren't maximizing now. And so I, I, I understand it. the tool is going to be used differently in different classrooms. But it's also important to note, if I can piggyback on what Kristen says, she has a great point. And I've had this discussion with some parents and some students. Having one-to-one -one technology doesn't mean that you throw out the door everything you're currently Absolutely doing right. for instructional mm -hmm. strategies. It just can, in, in math, for instance, yeah, you got to sit down and what you just described is a perfect example. But to have the online resources you said to go, if you don't understand a problem, and you can go on and see how it's done. And I, there was a math teacher that I know that used to have his lessons taught by the students looking at it online the night before and taking notes and trying them mm -hmm. so that when they were in class, they were actually working on what they didn't understand, and he was giving them instant feedback instead of flipping that and him teaching it, and they go home. So, I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of things you do, but the important thing is, and it's important for teachers to know too, you're not going to scrap everything you're doing. There's wonderful things happening in the classroom but there's a chance for technology to enhance what's currently being done in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Marissa has a question. Um, I think it really depends on the, for the um, classes that you don't really originally think could be benefited by this. I think it depends on the program and if the program's out there because um, I have recently, I don't have the best handwriting, so I have recently been taking my notes on my computer and it is really difficult with like math and physics and you have all these symbols and they don't normally have them on a keyboard. So I've been learning this like programming software where you just have to type in certain buttons and it'll pop it out. Um, and that's been kind of difficult, but I know I'm, there are programs out there where you can, they have the buttons there, so you just click it. And so it makes it just as easy as taking notes and it's cleaner and you can add in things and put in things and it'll re-space it instead of having like a bunch of arrows and stuff on your paper. Um, so I can see a lot of benefit in that. And then also I, I use that, like Khan Academy, and I use the online teaching resources a ton. Like the only times I really use my textbooks are for like the homework assignments, and then like learning it, I do online because it just it makes so much more sense when someone's talking to me instead of me reading this paper. And like I do a lot of those. Like there are teachers out there who will make their lesson and then have, like you were saying, have their students watch it and then next day they'll, the students will be prepared and I watch, I watch those even though they're not really for me. Um, because it's helpful. Um, it's a different way of learning and for you that works better, you know, and, and that's sort of how the educators and the professionals have to think about that is they need to figure out how to reach all the different types of learners. So having that access certainly would help and now I've got a fight going on between Jackie so and I just Chris. Have a, I just have a question if I may ask and m maybe they have an answer, maybe they don't. But I've heard that there are college students who never go to a class. There were college students sure. that never well, went to a class when I was right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I worked with you one of those guys. I was not one of them, no. But they, <laughs> but they do their, they do <laughs> their yeah, they do their classes in their dorm room on their computer. Sure. That's well, yeah, that's absolutely. not even new though. Right. No, that's <laughs> not new. <laughs> not even new. No, no. We took classes. They were called cable classes when he oh, went to school yeah. in Arizona, and you just tuned to their certain yeah. channel. Yeah. channel yeah. You're right. And you, you sat in your it. living room and you watched it. Yeah. You never yeah. went to class. Uh, I've done it. I've, I've done it. I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> I never could have. I would have loved that. All right. I think Chris is waiting, even though he said he's finished. Um, and I'll be brief. All right. So the uh, um, it sounds like that that it's not so much a hardware question for you guys. It's what kind of software we're going to put on there to integrate it, and, and and that sounds like that's part of the integrator's role to find the software to make it work. Um, it looks like from what this proposal is laying out, it's mostly the hardware pieces. Is that is that fair? Okay. Right. Um, to Jackie's point about the textbook refresh or something, I, I'd like to see that on the overall request that I said about where we're going to see the cost savings, whether it's paper, whether it's this, whether it's that. Um, I think we can integrate all that stuff when we get to that point of the proposal process where we can, we can not just the textbook refresh, it's going to be all kinds of other bullet item things that we can throw at it and say, here's where we think we're going to be more efficient, save more money, X, Y, Z, and then we, then we decide how we frame our discussions for the rest of the world. It is, however, a, a proposal that is making an advancement. It's not one that is saving money. No, uh, yeah, 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 that's because right. we, are, we are not going to save our way to, As I, yeah, to the I, funding of it. I don't see it being an offset by any stretch of the imagination. But just it, to be clear. Yeah, no, I think it's one more bullet item to put in on right. not just on the benefits to the, to the teaching. As I said, I, I think the board is pretty easy to convince that this is the right way to go from, a, from an education standpoint. I think we're all on board with that. I think it's wh where I think we're having the challenge is how do we package it? Sure. How do we make it presentable in a way that we can defend it and we can, we can move forward with it and we can make it successful? Yeah. So for example, information, we have not been refreshing our textbooks. So uh, right. we don't have that amount in our operating budget to say, okay, this, but I, we can provide you with facts such as the copyright dates of our current textbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we look at, you know, at 3-5, what, what our copyright dates of our current textbooks are. Well, that could be an offset. We exactly. can pay X amount to, to get new textbooks, or we and can take that X we were, amount and roll it yeah, into the... Right. And then you're program. keeping these textbooks, though, for... Right. I mean, I've seen some come from high school. They're 15 yeah. years old. We have old, maximized right? the value of our print resources. Mm. I mean, they're <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well maximized. Okay. Anybody, Marissa, I saw you with your hand up again. Yeah, 
that was a different point that I didn't make sense in my head anymore. But um, with the with the college classes that you don't have to go to your class. I've been on a lot of college tours where they say like, oh, like our professor films their classes. So like, if you're really tired or something, you can just watch it later. Um, and I really, I I think, I really hope that the parents and the students don't think that that's what this means, that the students, it's all just going to be technology and there's no, like, you can't talk to your professor and it's just like, and there's no human, like, interaction. Because I think the best way to use it would be a mixture between, like, taking your notes in your handwriting if that's what's good for you and talking to the professor and, and doing physical things and then also doing things that you find helpful for you. So that's, I think, a way to kind of tell people that it's not just. And, and that's why the term blended learning is often used, yeah. because it is that combination. And mm -hmm. effective instruction is effective instruction, no matter which tools or technology we mm -hmm. use. And, and also, the, the courses that I've taken online and that my, I, I watch my daughters take, mm -hmm. an online course is a lot harder than being in the classroom. <laughs> It is a lot hotter. The, that professor knows if you've been on there, and you better be you better be on there because <laughs> it's well known what what involvement you have in the course, and they're harder than regular college yeah. courses in the classroom. The so. question that hasn't been asked, and I'm surprised it hasn't been asked, oh. is the teacher's perspective in this. So part of our plan is, and some of them are probably hearing it tonight, is. We do need feedback from the teachers and from the staff, and it will be a part of our cycle of decision making. And we'll go to our leadership and we'll talk about how we'll roll it out. And we'll go to content area specifics, and then we'll come together as a faculty and we'll do uh, across content standards discussions. And we'll be asking how do we get feedback from our students and how do we find out what their needs are. So that will be a part of this process hmm. because otherwise, you know, you were talking about your investment. We need to ensure that our staff and students buy into this. And that's going to be an important part of what we'll do. And one other thing in conjunction with that, um, the when MLTI when we were fresh last year, MLTI did not provide devices anymore for the high school uh, staff. So we purchased the HP laptops for the high school staff. So they all have had them for a year already. Um. They know the device. They already have been out. Many of them have been out looking at different applications to use on it. They have different software loaded on there. So if this is not going to be a whole new world for them. They've already been on it and using it. I wanted to give one quick example of, you just said blended, about how it works best for students. So last night, an assignment that my daughters had to do for their science class was a vocabulary assignment, which in the old days, you just had the paper and you had your book. Maybe there's a glossary in the back. That's how you looked it up. So they still had their science book and there was still a glossary, but they were in Google Docs. They had a document frame all set up for them. They had to input their vocabulary words. The teacher you know, was in a different place. They had to retype them. They had to look up the words in the glossary. And then a thing to make you remember it, they had to go through Google Images um, or clip art and find a picture of each of the things. and then put it in the document right next to the vocabulary word. So when they're studying for their test, they've got the word, they've got the, the definition, and they've got the thing to help you remember it. And you could choose to draw it or do the clip art. One of my daughters drew it, the other one did the clip art. But it's just, it really still is very free for the students to decide how they're going to present their information. They just have more opportunities and more channels for it. So if you are a great artist and you want to take your poster for your, they had to do a math poster. They could do it however they wanted. There were no parameters on it. If they wanted to type it all up and print it out and stick it on the poster board, that was fine. If they wanted to do a PowerPoint or a Prezi, that was fine too. <coughs> there still is a lot of freedom even with one-to-one. -one. It's not like this is all you have now. You only have the laptop. You must only stare at the screen because that doesn't work for all kids. And I think that middle school teachers have done a very good job of recognizing and allowing students to have the freedom to make those choices still for themselves. And it's, I mean, I can't say enough great things about it. I think it's fantastic. And um, just as a side note, one of my daughters was is interviewing next week to be a cyber sleuth, and she is thrilled. Okay. <laughs> she is quite delighted. She goes, and we have the opportunity, which is what I said in the letter, opportunity to become Google ninjas. I don't know what that is, but it sounds great. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> you were really going to. 
weren't you? I'll make sure okay. you know. <laughs> so, uh, appreciate the presentation. I'm it's sure really we'll be nice. hearing really more good. about this uh, in March in a new proposal, I'm assuming. Yep. And so this is sort of something that we can all take away tonight and go home and take a look at. And obviously, if you have questions, those would be welcome as well. Direct them towards uh, <laughs> the superintendent, please. And seeing no other items on our agenda, I I'd like to meeting. tell the girls good luck with their exam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good luck. Good luck, ladies. And thank you for coming tonight. We know that this was kind of a, an extra thing on a night before the big test. So, any your, other items? Your input is Just great. Check with your parents to make sure they, if they want your picture on the website. If they don't, let us know right away, okay? So we don't put it up for you. Okay. Just want their approval. So you have you have my email address. So just yes, drop us. A, just drop me an email and say my parents said it was fine to put my picture up. So so that I have it documented so that we can. You need it from my parents card. also. Or? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think maybe you're out for your from my kids. Yeah. Very All right. Better. So the will of the board this evening at this point. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor of adjourning this evening. Seven plus two. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Anybody else want to girls?